Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're going to continue just inching our way through the opening chapter of John to revisit the bedrock foundation of the Redemption Church as we prepare to enter into a building as our years of exodus may be coming to an end we want to remember how we began and the very first sermon of the redemption church exposited these same words so welcome home to your church we looked uh we looked at verses uh 6 through 13 yesterday and today we're going to add on one verse that's verse 14 so here's if you're watching this on video a look at the verses we covered yesterday, and here is the verse that we add on today. John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This opening phrase is theologically quite important that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Anytime a new teaching about Jesus springs up, it, seem, it seeks always to demote Jesus, to demean Jesus. That's necessary to criticize Jesus because he's unassailable and he's perfect as he is. So be ever skeptical of any kind of nuanced teaching of Jesus that ever so subtly, with the slickness of the tongue of the serpent in Eden, attend, attempts to just etch away any iota of the virtue of Jesus, the holiness of Jesus, the power of Jesus. If it attempts to reframe Jesus, this is necessary, a necessary step. To criticizing Jesus because as he has revealed himself, as he is in his word, he's unassailable. He is fully God and fully man. These are both necessary in our understanding because if you demote the humanity of Jesus, then you are attempting to demean the significance of the cross and even the resurrection. If you demote the, the divinity of Jesus, then you're trying to point to Jesus as a mere mortal in some way. And so he, it's, it's important to understand what the Word of God says about Jesus. The Word became flesh. So the Word, here we are again. If you've been with us in the last few devotions, you know this is the Logos. Here he is, primordial logic personified. John 1.14, the Word became flesh. And he dwelt among us. It's kind of a horrifying prospect when you think about it, that God's here. <laughs> I mean, it's someone who's aware of my own sin that would terrify me. But look at who Jesus is. He's full of grace and truth. That word right there gives me hope. Deism has no place in a biblically literate church. Deism is the idea that like God created, but he just kind of left it alone. It grows in popularity because atheists who are just so sick of pretending like universes can create themselves, and they're so tired of the acrobatics that they have to do, the intellectual backbending they have to do to pretend like life can create itself. And they're just they're they're also tired of trying to solve the riddle that Aristotle could not solve. Without the logos, without that authoritative, timeless arbiter behind right and wrong it's impossible to say anything meaningful and so they'll they think take a step closer to god and become deists which means okay i believe god's real and he created the earth but that's it god exists but he doesn't care about what's happening here look at the chaos that abounds rather than saying okay that's consistent with the biblical worldview we know that the our enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, they, they feel like they have to let God off the hook for evil by saying that the presence of evil indicates that he's, I guess, indifferent. And they feel like the presence of evil is something that assails 
the holiness of God. And so they'd rather, they'd rather just demote the intimacy of God with his creation. But the true motivation here is to no longer be haunted by these questions and just to get away with sin. Men prefer darkness to light because our deeds are evil. But this says that the word himself became flesh and he dwelt among us. Okay, my kids have told me about this game among us. It's basically mafia if you're old school. <laughs> He's here. All right, he, he dwelt among us. It's part of the reason why his name is Emmanuel. You heard that name before? That means God with us. This is what's taught in John 1.14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now here John is speaking from those who were firsthand observers of the life and ministry and works and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, John's the only one who stood by the cross. Peter eventually fled in shame after denying Jesus three times. But John was there with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it's to John, our earthly author through whom the Holy Spirit inspired these words, that Jesus entrusted the care of Mary, now in the absence, perhaps posthumously, of Joseph. We, John says observed his glory. The glory is the one and only son from the father. There are no other sons like this. Now, I, I taught this early on and it's time to say it again. Uh, it'll be important when we study uh, books like Job and when I go and reteach Genesis again, which I have not done in, in a few years now, uh, that's going to come up again. Uh, okay, hold your, your pitchforks back. It's going to sound like I'm a raging heretic at first, and then I'll explain, and you'll be like, oh, okay. Uh, there are multiple sons of God. I'm not a heretic. Hear me out. When you see God's description of the angels, they're sometimes referred to as the lowercase s, sons of God. This, however, is the one and only son from the Father. The glory as the one and only Son from the Father sets him distinctive. He alone is the true Son of God. And look at this descriptor, full of grace and truth. These are both important. Okay? Grace is perhaps Jesus' most popular attribute because we're sinners. And when we acknowledge that, we need the grace we need the grace. We need the grace. The grace is our only chance. We can't earn our way to heaven by our own merit. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we need the grace and truth. This is less popular. <laughs> Even people who really like Jesus and they really like his grace, they don't want to hear about his truth because his truth is that you got to take up your cross every day and follow him. You got to deny yourself. That's truth. He came and he brings a sword and it has a way of even dividing families. That's truth. That's hard to hear. But aren't you grateful for the grace? The two are not in conflict with one another. The two aspects, of the glory of the word become flesh, observed by John and company, shared with you and me right now under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reading the timeless words of John's gospel, is that he is full of grace and he is full of truth. And the two are not in conflict. Here's why. If it were not for the grace, you and I would have no chance of being saved. If we were not also full of truth, his grace would lack power because we would deceive him with self-righteousness. But full of truth, totally aware of our sin, also full of grace, he's sent into the world that all who would call upon his name would not perish, but have everlasting life. So observe, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son with a capital S from the father. He is full of grace. He is full of truth. The teachings of the Redemption Church, I pray, are like this. They are full of grace and they're full of truth. Grace sells a lot of books. 
truth seems not to. When I was a teaching pastor at a church in Nashville and I was working full time for a Christian publisher, I felt like I wasn't teaching enough. I wasn't preaching enough. And because my travel schedule was so crazy, it didn't allow me to be present in the pulpit at my church enough. And we already had a lead pastor. Dr. Polly Rouse did a great job expositing the word for Hermitage Hills Baptist Church. And so he would just give me teaching opportunities from time to time, along with Ed Ollie and, and, and other pastors there. But I felt like, man, even if I'm on the road, even if I'm flying around, you know, doing this job for this Christian publisher, I still got to be able to, I still got to be able to share the gospel. And so I taught the gospel of John verse by verse uh, through this platform called Live Bible. And I think actually just recently I put the, I put it back up, livebible.tv. And in that, in that, uh, that, that series, um, going verse by verse through the gospel of John. Um, you know, we, we saw the full grace of God on display. We saw the full tough truth on display. And, uh, in that time I came under fire and, uh, received some death threats. Actually, I think there's still a fatwa issued against me and my family. Um, but, there was something else too. The video platform that I used happened to come with a certain analytic that just kind of showed me uh, who was engaging and who wasn't. And I noticed a trend and I, I felt compelled for the sake of research to deliver my teaching of the text in a certain way to just kind of test this trend that I'd picked up on. It seemed like the more I talked about grace the more people tuned in and the more I talked about truth, the faster, like the analytics just dropped like a rock. And so I emphasized the grace, emphasized the grace, emphasized the grace for the first half of one of these messages on livebible.tv. And then for the second half, I emphasized the truth. I emphasized the truth. I emphasized the truth. I used the word grace and mercy over and over again in the first half. And I used words like repentance and sin over and over again in the second half. And it actually created like a clear delta. It created like a clear, uh, I guess it wouldn't strictly speaking be classified as a bell curve, but you could just see how grace really brought in the viewers and truth really, really cut down on the traffic. <laughs> I shared this with my uh, my supervising professor at Southern Seminary, Dr. Michael Pullman. And, uh, and he was like, he's like, yeah, because of technology today, you know, uh, those who teach are able to tap into information and data that, uh, maybe pastors shouldn't be able to see <laughs> because what are you going to do with that data? Well, there are churches that will strictly emphasize the grace and the mercy and never give any kind of truth because that boosts your numbers, but then you're not telling truth. And if you tell only the truth and you never share the grace, then you're also only telling half the picture. And so at the Redemption Church, what we say is that an accurate gospel presentation includes both the wrath that God has for sin and the mercy that God has for sinners. And a complete gospel presentation must include both of these. Jesus himself, according to the Gospel of John, was full of grace, and he's full of truth. So don't tune me out just because I read something out of the text that makes you mad at me. I'm always going to end with grace. I'm always going to share the gospel every single week. We're also going to share the truth. And I'm fully aware of how that impacts attendance and engagement and numbers. But I got to do it anyway because it's what God said. I pray that you receive this as honesty. It's Christ-like teaching to be full of grace and full of truth. Amen?